Okay, here we are on this wonderfully beautiful day previewing Clark's auction. It's this Sunday, September 29th, starts at 10 a.m. Previews are this Thursday, Friday, and Saturday from noon to six. We have a wonderful menage of items. Not a huge lot, but we have a nice load. We're gonna start off here with this uh, 1985 Fiat Spider. I believe it only has about 26,000 original miles, runs nicely. It has a hard top, soft top. Needs a bit of a clean, but we get around to that. Bit smaller than my own personal Cadillac here, but a nice car. I believe it's estimated six to nine thousand. Okay, into the main room. Nice compact little sale, wonderful art, wonderful sculpture, wonderful Asian, wonderful everything. Okay, we're gonna start over here. We, we have a pair of chairs. These come from Scarsdale. Very heavy, looks like a rosewood. Beautiful bronze mounts on them, great quality. Plenty of bronze <coughs> mounting on it with the griffins here and the feet here. Egyptian sort of revival feet on them. In between the two chairs, we have this wonderful marble top, French console, sort of shabby chic looking with the paint, but wonderful take look at that specimen type marble on top of it. Atop this, this came from Queens or from Long Island actually, we have this wonderful chrome uh, abstract sculpture. And this is by a Canadian artist, I believe his name is Grediaga. Anyway, nice big size. Here to, to the center of the room, we have a wonderful color, round Carl Springer table. This has two leaves, slightly as is around the edges, but that can be stained back to normal. And as in the house in uh, Harrison, seated around the table are five leather casino chairs. All five of them estimated six to 900, I believe. And matching the color nearly on top is this really beautiful Tiffany Studios acorn lamp. Wonderful original shade, beautiful patina on it, nice base. The shade is signed and number. The base, I believe, is not signed. However, it is definitely Tiffany, a nice original patina. Okay, before we move in the main room, as always, we have, once again, we have another Steinway. This one is a Model S, mahogany case. A nice case, nice shape. The board seems to be in pretty good shape. The case is a bit scratched, so it could do with the refinishing anyway. You should send whoever it is in to check it out. It's estimated lightly at two to three thousand. Before we go in the main room, we have this wonderful uh, Dancer Bronze. Look at the height of it, it's gonna be four foot high. This is by a, an Australian artist called Guy Martin. Okay, and to the left of that, extra large size Maturin Moro on the top its original base, but I believe the actual bronze, which is signed and it's got its foundry stamp, is 41 inches high, just the bronze. So an unusual size. This one's estimated two to 3,000. Into the main room. Okay, nicely decorated. The boys have done a good job again. We're gonna start with some of the smalls here. We have a nice selection of clocks and grandfather clocks in the sale. This is a bronze little mantle clock. Here, this liar form clock, I believe is a company called Derverbrie from Paris. Below here, oyster plates, stemware bronzes. We have, uh, for you smokers that are still left out there, we have a selection of pipes, including Dunhill and handmade pipes. Over here, we have this absolutely wonderful little, um, what would you call it, miniature. Little miniature could be used as a jewelry box, but a beautiful bronze mounted and porcelain mounted French commode. We have some Versace porcelains. Two lots, two, two patterns, two nice big groupings of Versace porcelain. Moving along here, back to some clocks. We have this Tiffany uh, Tiffany Studio or Tiffany & Co. It's a uh, ship's wheel clock. We have Le Coultre Atmos clocks. We have French carriage clocks. Below here, we have two large pieces of art glass. Look at this big, large piece of Favreau. We've put them down as loads, but we figure maybe it's not loads now. Okay, we have more sculpture here. We have this Wedgwood uh, bust of Minerva. Now to the mid-century, we have a lot of generic and a lot of name stuff. We have this pair of open front bookcases. We have this pretty wonderful desk here. This came from a local estate, came with this chair. So the chair sits there. Nice lines on it, no name on it, but nice lines to it. Came with another lot of three chairs. And on top of this, we have this loose side. I don't know if it's an ice bucket. Has an interior, and this is obviously Carl Springer. This is Chagrin, slightly as is. It just needs a bit of gluing. Nice mid-century desk here. Two things I like in the sale are these two little lamps. Glass base, nice marble little center, but nice delicate lamps. Noting all the time, we got plenty of carpets on the floor. We have this wonderful pair of, wonderful pair of I would say, Macasker, you know, uh, wood pedestals in the sort of Ruhlman style. 
We have Danish modern, this nice rosewood oval table with two leaves. Nice clock here in the style of Macintosh. Moving right along to our, I suppose you could call this used furniture. We have this nice bow front, little satin wood server. Nice handmade one, a little bit of inlay. We've got lots of small end tables and here we have a nice bronze mounted leather top bureau plat, nice thick bronze. Nice quality, heavy duty, bronze, good size. Atop this we have this oh, wood carving, probably Italiano, 17th or 18th century. Goes together with a bust. To the right of it, this is a really wonderful bronze bust. This is signed Fortini, Professor Fortini. Nice big size, beautiful quality. Over here, I, I like this one myself. It's good weight on this bronze, but it's a peanut lamp. Nice quality, nice gilding. We have below that an Art Deco dental cabinet. Here we have a Louis XV1 style, gilt wood and carved, little settee. Nice with the uh, faux skin backing, nice leather interior. Ready to go into the house, all good, good, well upholstered. Here we have a set of six Louis XV1 style chairs. Nice sort of shabby chic looking, but good and strong chairs, nicely upholstered. And in inside of this, we have this table, Louis Philippe style. This is bronze mounted. Could possibly be Jan Sam. It's got great quality. It has one large leaf and two smaller leaves. As I said, we have a lot of grandfather clocks in the sale. We have these two here. There's a pine one. Let me get my glasses on for this fellow. This is John Walder and Cornhill from London. Big clock. This pine clock has no name on it. Nice early clock though. Over here, back to our sculpture, we have this Russian bronze grouping, signed. Look at the size of this. Maybe slightly as is there, but anyway, this is a nice, look at this for a big size. Where do you see one that size anymore? We have an interesting pair. Look at these large pair of sconces, sort of torsier style. Big sconces. This is uh, Le Lieu. This armoire, nice Art Deco burl walnut armoire by Le Lieu to the used furniture. Normally we don't take in these sofas, but it's actually a really comfortable one. Actually, I was gonna have a doze on it the other night. That's why I decided to include it in the video. Nice, comfortable, nice down filled. Here in front of this in a bag style, we have this giltwood serpentine side, three piece um, coffee table. Mid-century, we have this nice pair of Barcelona chairs, good weight on them. Nice quality leather, nicely upholstered. One of the buttons is slightly pulled out, but you can fix that. Here from the uh, Stitch Estate, we have this harp. This is signed Le Lille, Paris, I believe. Yes, here we go. Le Lille and Lyon, a Paris, Lyon, Paris. Okay, here atop this, I would call this probably Dutch market re-inlaid Queen Anne style table. This top flips over and it comes uh, felt. On top of this, this is a wonderful lot. We have a grouping of three bronze, I suppose, Roman classical busts. Wonderful patina, good age on them, nicely mounted. I think they're one of the nice lots of sale. Here we have a really nice Italian bench. Also came from the uh, uh, Stitch Estate. Nice with the metal foliate on it. Here we have what I believe is an Adrian Pearsall sofa. Once again, like that green one, it's competing with the older green one. Good big size. Nice and comfortable, I'll leave you to decide as to which one is more comfortable when you come in. Below this we have this big, big carpet. Sort of a Harry's looking carpet, nice colours, nice pattern. Still got a good pile on it. This bull is in our next auction in case anyone's wondering. Then we have this three-piece mid-century set. Laminate wood, laminate bent wood. Beautiful because we've got a settee in those two pieces. And here a lot of people have been ringing up about the armoire. Well, this is the size of it. This is a miniature armor, just like the miniature commode. This one has good age, nice bronze mountings, nice original patina. Mid-century vein again. We have these pair, large pair of Murano, what I suppose they call the mushroom lamp, signed Murano. Below that, a pair of end tables I love. With the caning on the bottom, the nice light blue, slightly as is in the back, I believe. Here we have a Silas Shondal table, signed and dated. I believe it's dated in the late 70s or 80s. Above this, Crams. We did very well with some globes in the last sale, so we have another one. We have this Crams terrestrial globe in this sale. We're going to swing over here past some of the porcelains, which we don't normally do, but 
We have a large collection of Arabia, Finland. Look at that nice blue porcelain. This here, we have a huge lot. We have two lots of this, but it's really nice. It looks like German, we couldn't figure out the maker. We have Minton porcelain. We have Waterford cut glass stemware. We have more Minton. This here is Maitland Smith, nice leather top gain table, wonderful condition, all inlaid all over. Here, something I like, and they're very popular now. This is a vintage, age-wise I don't know, but it's got good age. It's an enamel two-sided camel sign. Aim style chair in Ottoman, mid-century uh, tea cart. And here we have a Davy Crockett Fescoon cap. This cap was gifted by Fess Parker to the consigner. So it's an original hat. We have all the details on the site, so www.clarkmy.com gets full details on that. Here we have a nice uh, decorative leather top desk on what they call horse base. And one of my favorite items in the sale is this patinated rooster. Good, look, look at the size of that, wonderful routine, a great looking item. We have a pair of these copper tables. We have a pair of those brass tables. We have cartel clocks. We have Biedermeyer furniture. We have more grandfather clocks. Look at this French one here in the banjo style. Beautiful tin painted tin work up on top here. And a lot of this stuff came from the Stitch Henderson estate and particularly I nearly missed it, but I want to point out this clock here. This we believe came from the Russian tea rooms. Wonderful two-sided clock, big size. And last but not least also from that estate up in Connecticut is this what they call a daytime register clock. So a good paella of stuff here this sale. So make sure you come and preview. It's Thursday, Friday, Saturday, noon to 6 p.m. Sale Sunday at 10 a.m. Visit our site. You can bid live on the internet. Thank you and see you then. Hi, Will Schweller here to preview some of the fine art lots for Clark Auctions September 29th sale. I'd like to start with this watercolor by the French painter Albert Gliese. Gliez was one of the founding fathers of Cubism and continued to work in the Cubist mode throughout his career well after Cubism sort of moved past, you know, the avant-garde. This work from 1921 is an example of that in which he uses shape, color, and line to create a nearly abstract Cubist composition with forms slightly resembling a guitar. This piece comes out of a Scarsdale collection and has a 1000 to 1500 estimate. From the same collection, we have this color lithograph by the English artist Henry Moore. Moore's printed work uh, shows him working with similar themes and motifs that you'd find in his sculptures, namely reclining, highly abstracted female forms. Working with prints allowed Moore to explore color in a way that bronze doesn't necessarily. This piece from that same collection has a five to seven hundred dollar estimate. Also from the same Scarsdale collection is this pastel by the Russian-born American artist Max Weber. Weber was instrumental in bringing a lot of the European forms of modernism to America. Um, and this work from 1954 shows Weber sort of returning to a vaguely cubist Picasso-esque mode um, to depict two seated female figures. This work has a four to six thousand dollar estimate. Above that we have a oil on canvas from the American illustrator Edmund Franklin Ward. Ward studied at the Art Students League with Rockwell and worked alongside Rockwell at the Saturday Evening Post producing illustrations for stories and advertisements uh, throughout much of the 20th century. This work here shows figures uh, recoiling in horror and almost has a, a pulp cover feel to it. This work comes from a New York City collection and has a $1,000 to $1,500 estimate. From a Long Island collection, we have this acrylic on canvas by the American abstractionist Robert Natkin. This work from his Bath Apollo series in the late 70s, this particular piece is from 1979, shows Natkin working with, with really subtle variations of color and line to sort of capture the you know, atmosphere of, of light hitting different surfaces. He was really inspired by Matisse's interiors and the sort of abstracted spaces that Matisse was able to create. This work has a three to $5,000 estimate. Above it, we have an oil on canvas by the American social realist Raphael Sawyer. Sawyer is known for his nude female figures, and this is a prime example of that. This work comes from the same Scarsdale collection as a lot of the works we've already seen, and has a thousand to $1,500 estimate. 
Again, from that Scarsdale collection, we have a second work by Max Weber, this piece a gouache from 1910. It's rather easy to imagine this work uh, from 1910 really startling American audiences um, because this is when Weber is first starting to introduce you know, the, the themes and, and motifs explored by Picasso and Brock and others to an American audience. This work has, like the other Weber, a four to $6,000 estimate. Below that, we have a second Henry Moore lithograph. This piece, Reclining Woman Number 2, has a two to $3,000 estimate. To the left of the Moor, we have an oil on board by the Italian-born American painter Luigi Lucioni. Lucioni is known for his portraits as well as his uh, New England landscapes. This is an example of the latter, of course. And the work has a three to $5,000 estimate. It came out of a Bronxville, New York collection. From a Long Island collection, we have this small, charming little oil on board by the Russian artist David Berliak. This is Prime Berliak uh, with his rather heavy impasto to create these flowers, as well as the flowers on the porcelain vase. I think his treatments of the two is, is very interesting when compared to one another. This work has a thousand to fifteen hundred dollar estimate. From the same New York collection as the Ward, we have this gouache by the Cuban artist Victor Manuel. Manuel was inspired by Gauguin and other European artists um, and brought their techniques back to Cuba with him to create a uniquely Cuban art form. He's known mostly for his portraits of women. This is an example of that. Um, this work has a three to $5,000 estimate. On the other wall here, I'd just like to quickly point out this portrait by George Romney. This is gonna be in our October 27th sale. Um, and above the door here, in a slightly different mode, we have this oil on board by the American painter John Costigan. Costigan's known for his really heavy applications of paint and color and his treatment of sort of the common, the common man, if you will. This is a, a group of bathers and has a $1,000 to $1,500 estimate. We have several other Costigans in the sale, um, both watercolors and oils. To the left of that, we have this lithograph by the American regionalist artist, John Stuart Curry. This work from 1942 is titled Our Good Earth and shows an American farmer holding wheat. Curry's known for his depictions of, of Kansas life um, and really celebrating you know, the American working man during the Depression and World War II. This piece, which comes out of a Westchester collection, has an eight to $1,200 estimate. From the same collection and the same you know, period and style, we have this Thomas Hart Benton lithograph, Cradling Wheat. Benton, like Curry, was interested in capturing sort of American regionalism, celebrating both the modern in America as well as more traditional forms of life. And here we see figures cradling wheat. Um, and this demonstrates Benton's trademark sort of flowing style. This has a thousand to $1,500 estimate. Below that, we have a watercolor of the Harlem River by the American artist and architect Stanford White. White was one of the preeminent architects of the late 19th, early 20th century, known for his neoclassical style, um, but also an accomplished draftsman in watercolors, as we see here. This piece, which comes out of the New Milford, Connecticut collection of Skitch Henderson, who was Johnny Carson's band leader, as well as the founder of the New York Pops, has an eight to $1,200 estimate. From the same collection as the Natkin, we have this acrylic on canvas by the second wave abstract expressionist, Paul Jenkins. This piece from 1981 is titled Phenomena Round Numbers and really is, is a highlight of Jenkins's later career. While his early works tend to have sort of more flat applications of paint, like this passage here, this piece shows a, a rather dramatic use of impasto, which is, which is something that he developed late in the 70s uh, and was really mastering by the early 80s. This work, which has Gimple and Weizenhofer Gallery labels on the back, has a ten dollars to $15,000 estimate. To the left of it, we have a second watercolor from the Skitch Henderson collection by Stanford White. This piece is called, uh, titled The Covered Bridge and also has an eight to $1,200 estimate. Above that, from the same Scarsdale collection as a lot of the works we've already viewed, is a charming little watercolor by the French neo-impressionist Paul Signac. Uh, this work shows the Brittany coast. It's titled The Coast of Brittany at Pine Pompul. Um, and is, is really a, a hallmark of Signac's watercolor where he uses dark lines to create an almost quick fleeting glance of the French coast. This piece has an eight to $1,200 estimate. Above that, we have a piece by Samuel Margulies titled Man's Canyons. While Curry and Benton were interested in exploring sort of rural America, Margulies was celebrating the modern New York City. And here he uses 
the Chrysler Building and the Empire State Building to create a really sort of abstracted, pure Manhattan that is, you know, almost as grand as a, a Moran painting of the Grand Canyon or something like that. This piece has a four to $6,000 estimate and comes out of a Westchester collection. To conclude, I would like to show this watercolor by the German-born American modernist Oskar Blumner from the same Scarsdale collection that we've already been uh, discussing. This work, which shows a countryside scene, is trademark Blumner in its use of color to really create a mood. Blumner was an early proponent of color theory in the modern and worked to create primarily landscapes that sort of capture the avant-garde feeling of European painting but in an American context. This work has a six to $9,000 estimate. As with every month, this video only shows a few pieces from the sale, so I encourage you to check out our catalog at www.clarkny.com. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to contact the gallery. Thanks. Hi, I'm Senko, and I'm gonna walk you through some highlights for this Sunday's sale. We're gonna start here with this drawing by Yasuo Kuniyoshi. Um, Kuniyoshi was a Japanese-American artist. He immigrated to the United States when he was 17 in 1906. Yasuo Kuniyoshi spent most of his life painting images of women with sort of unrealistic proportions, um, challenging conceptions of modern beauty um, until World War II, at which point he became an enemy alien as a Japanese-American. And during the war, his artwork took on a much more melancholy tone, um, trying to describe the loneliness and the despair that many people felt um, during and after the war. This particular work is a study for a painting that is currently um, in Georgia called She Mourns. The original painting is a gouache in these deep blue tones, um, but this particular sketch uh, is, is just a, a pencil sketch that depicts a woman crying, um, holding a handkerchief to her face. Um, and this was painted, or uh, I'm sorry, this was drawn in 1946, um, j just during his period uh, where he really started to explore these themes of despair and loneliness. This painting is estimated at 1,000 to 1,500. Mm. This drawing is estimated at 1,000 to 1,500. Uh, moving on into some porcelains. This is one of my favorites. It's a lovely little vase um, with really detailed enamel work. Uh, probably late Qing Dynasty, and then these panels here on either side depicting the eight immortals crossing the sea. This has undergone significant restoration work. It's very good restoration, it's very difficult to see, um, but the restoration does span um, most of the object. Moving on, we have a lovely little set of six plates with this foliate pie crust sort of edge. Um, Gilding to the edges is very worn, and some of the uh, enamel in the center is a little bit worn, which is typical of these earlier export um, enamels. Each one of these plates has a different scene on it. Um, these are all scenes of sort of recreational activities within either a palace uh, courtyard or within um, the, the courtyard of an upscale family. Um, and you can really see the detail here on each one of the robes, how, how delicately it's been painted. Um, and these are some really lovely examples of earlier export porcelain. Here we have a Tian Chou Ping. Um, this is a, a bottle vase painted with these mythical beasts called Bixie. You see them here playing in the waves with very typical uh, late Qing enamels um, and this iron red cloud work up above. This one has an apoc apocryphal Qianlong mark to the underside, uh, but that is just that, only apocryphal. Uh, we have a really nice selection of cloisonne in this sale. This is one of my favorites um, in the cloisonne section. This is the so-called money toad uh, as an incense burner. Normally you would see a little coin held here between his teeth, um, but very nicely done, very uh, 
sort of heavy, high quality metal, um, and then his companion uh, riding on his back. This is paired together with two of these much later, uh, early 20th century little boxes. Um, each one of these has a mark on the underside that corresponds likely to a pattern that um, the artisan was following. This is a lovely little Buddhist altar. You would expect to see a Buddha seated here, probably in the same cloisonne. Uh, the Buddha is missing, but the altar all the same is very beautiful. Um, we've got this lotus pattern here to the underside. I love how the, the red sort of fades into the, the white, creating this pinkish um, gradation to the blossoms. Um, and this is decorated all the way around to the back as well. with these apsaras uh, flying up here that would have framed the Buddha nicely, um, whatever was sitting here. A lovely pair of yellow ground candle prickets. Um, these two are very nicely enameled, probably a little bit later than this one, um, and also with enameling on the underside. Uh, it's just a really lovely pattern, really bright yellow, Typical of the imperial family, but unlikely to have been associated with them. Uh, we have here a pair of Tibetan butter lamps. These are traditionally uh, filled with clarified yak butter, um, and a wick is then lit in the center. These are meant as a meditation aid um, for monks. Finishing off our porcelains here, we have a pair of copper red vases. These two are separate lots, but it's interesting to be able to see them together and next to each other. Um, this one is a little bit older of the two. And you can see this very fine crushed strawberry glaze here. Um, these sort of splotches of darker red uh, dripping down across the body of the vase and then fading into this beige tone up at the top near the mouth. This one has a blank underside, but um, the color of the glaze and, and the way it is modeled suggests that it's a little earlier than this one, um, which is more of this liver color, a little more typical of the late 19th century. Um, we have an apocryphal Kangxi mark on the underside, and you get these little splotches of almost green, which is an attempt to um, imitate the peach bloom glaze but not quite successful. Um, finally, these two little horses, you would normally see these in a set of eight, but they're really just, they're so expressive. Um, and we've got this little apocryphal Qianlong mark to the underside, very nicely, cleanly done um, with a little, uh, a little circle of unglazed biscuit on the underside um, that indicates probably early 20th century manufacture. Um, this is just a cute little bit of coral carved in the form of a lioness. Um, you can really see all of the details here. You can see her ribs. You can see the way the skin folds at the back of the neck. Um, and you have these lovely little splotches of white in this salmon colored coral. This is estimated at three to five hundred dollars. Now my overall favorite in the sale is this beautiful little wedding cup. Beautiful relief carving with these lingzhi fungus here on one side and the bamboo with the berries on the other side, surrounded by these two lion masks. Really lovely little piece, estimated at 1,000 to 1,500. We'll finish up over here with this brown ground dragon robe on this very finely done um, silk gauze. You can see it's sort of see-through here. This is probably late Qing Dynasty. Um, we've got nine dragons on it to the interior of the robe on this front panel. We've got that last hidden dragon down here. Really nicely done, a little bit of fading, a little bit of dust, but on the whole, a lovely piece. That's gonna be it for our Asian highlights. There's lots more online, and as always, you can email me or call for condition reports or questions. We'll see you on Sunday. Hi and welcome to the video preview of our September 29th auction of jewelry and silver. We'll start here 
This is from a Queen's Estate. A really beautiful, I believe this, there is Sotheby's Provenance, an email correspondence with um, one of these Sotheby's appraisers stating that this is a early 19th century, early 18th century form, but it has a replaced lid and finial that is 19th century. But it is stamped on the bottom JW Forbes, so it's early American coin silver. Um, whatever it might be, it's here to sell at four to 600, but it is an, a unique, interesting piece with a beautiful uh, bird form spout. Again, 19th century, this is Gorham, but if we can just take a look at the, the decoration here to the the, the body of vessel. Really beautiful. Really beautifully done. Beautiful detailing. This is in at five to seven hundred. Grouping of continental silver with a pair of baskets, floral swags, open work design, cobalt liners, and then a pair of really nice German pooty form candlesticks on plinth bases. Floral decorations, some acanthus leaves, the upraised arms with the laurel wreaths, really quite nice. The two together, so the two baskets and the two candelabra, candlesticks together at eight to 1200. So here, another early piece of American silver, a really nice pedestal bowl or a cake plate, but all of this intricate silver work, really beautifully done. Nice base, you can see all the detailing. Again, this is Gorham. English silver, so 18th and 19th century English silver, so we have a silver salver, and then this open work compote. One of these groupings that I particularly like, uh, these little objects, DR, or little decorative accessories. How sweet is this guy? A little porcupine. I believe it's a toothpick holder. It's silver plate, but he's sweet as can be on this later marriage of a wooden base. We have some cabinet bronzes. We have some Russian kiddish cups, some other little bronzes, but probably the nicest piece in this grouping is this early American Schiebler. So it's sterling with the applied bugs. So we have dragonflies and flies and a spider. And you open it up and guess what? It's corkscrew. How cool is that? And all of these pieces are together at four to 600. Another really nice piece of early American silver. So this is Kirk. So it's uh, out of Baltimore. Typical Kirk work with the heavy re repoussé floral design. Um, the paw feet, really beautiful. It is early, so it is 19th century. And this is here to sell at eight to 1200. France, Reed and Barton Francis, the first flatware service. Really nice, pretty straightforward what it is. So we have the beautiful uh, fruit and foliate form design to the handles here to sell at eight to 1200. Another nice American flatware service. So this one is Gorham, really nice, nice handles, nice in the fitted case. Again, here to sell at, I believe, eight to 1200. We have a Tiffany and Company service, so this is the Flemish pattern. Some pieces are monogrammed, some aren't, but it's a heavy service, really great quality, so nice weight to the pieces. This is a pair of Alvin Sterling glass vases with the silver overlay. Really sweet at three to 500. And one of the cooler pieces in this sale is this really nice Gorham World War I shrapnel cocktail shaker. So originally, on the interior of the base, there was a carrier and you would lift it up and there would be, I believe, four or six glasses. And then on the top, so this all fits together. I'm not gonna be able to get this off because you're all watching, but it's a cocktail shaker. So you would shake up your drinks in here. The lid comes off. It's all marked on the bottom. So it says, facsimile 18 pounder shrapnel shell. And this is by Gorham and it's circa 1918. This is 1,000 to 1,500. Moving on to our jewelry, a lot of really nice pieces in this sale. Um, 14 karat gold interlocking hoop necklace, really nice statement necklace. In the style of Victorian slide braces, so these are all 14 karat gold. This one's actually a watch, so it's a watch base. So it just opens up right here, but really nice. Some carved chalcedony, a cameo, garnet, tiger's eye, etc. 18 karat gold and diamonds, so again, another statement bracelet, but really quite nice. The diamonds are of a nice quality. And this is beautiful. So this is 15 karat gold, I believe, with sapphire cabochons and rose-cut diamonds. But these, are, these diamonds are a nice size. So they are rose-cut diamonds, so they're flatter, opposed to the round, brilliant cuts, but a beautiful design and quality to these pieces. This is Tiffany & Company, so it's 18 karat gold with the five round, brilliant cut diamond accents, and this is estimated at two to 3,000. 
coral beaded bracelet with the cameo, 14 karat gold, so it can be worn just as straight or you can make it a torsade. So you can twist it around and give it a different look. But really pretty at four to 600. David Webb with the three bands of diamond accents. Again, 18 karat gold and platinum. This is by Henrik Caston, who he did, a, he did a lot of collaborations with Salvador Dali. And he was also known for working closely with opera singers and musicians. And by consigner provenance, this was made for her, her mother, who was an opera, her grandmother, who was an opera singer. Um, so it's beautiful. And this, I believe, is um, one of the Thai goddesses for music and song. So it's a really nice piece, stamped verso, diamonds and rubies. Let's see, we'll move on to here. So this is 18 karat gold and platinum with the pearl and the bicolor surround of white and yellow gold. Pretty at five to 700. And this is one of my favorite pieces in this auction. So this is a moss agate brooch and it is Victorian um, with the enamel surround and little trefoils of rose cut diamonds. But if you can just take a look, really take a look at how, how beautifully centered this, it, it's essentially an inclusion. So what you see in diamonds, what determines its value. This is also an inclusion, but it's terribly beautiful. I mean, really phenomenal. It looks kind of like a piece of coral. I mean, it's just a wonderful organic form. And it is inscribed verso. So you can actually probably see the image better on the back side, just for video purposes, but it's phenomenal. I mean, it's really, really beautiful. Uh, moving on, a more contemporary piece. This is a pair of Elsa Peretti for Tiffany 18 karat gold earrings with the original dust jacket and box. Another interesting piece in the sale is this carved rock crystal ruby and diamond maple leaf brooch. So it does come with the original receipt. So this is attributed to Marcel Boucher. Um, really quite nice. This is a 14 karat gold Swiss minute repeater. So I'm going to press this button and hopefully it'll work for you. So you can see that it is in working condition. I can open the front for you, see what else it has to show you. So here it is. Really nice at 8 to 1200. Um, a little suite of Henry Dunay. So this is hand hammered gold. So let's see, put it on here. Really quite nice. So it's kind of the, got this faceted, hand, it's more than hand hammered. So faceted design, it's 18 karat gold with the matching earrings. Really nice. Um, 14 karat gold crown with the blue enamel decoration and diamonds. A little three piece suite of mabe pearls, enamel, and gold. We have a, some coins in the sale. So these are all US $5 coins. So these three, these four are together. And then we have a single 1907 US $10 gold coin. Uh, moving on, this is a grouping of 18 karat gold earrings. So I believe that these are by Irving Katz. It came from his estate. Um, and these two pair of earrings are together at five to 700. A nice pearl necklace grouping. So we have pretty typical single strand with the gold clasps. But then this is a really nice diamond inlaid floral clasp. I mean, this can be repurposed. I know pearls aren't, aren't the hottest item at the moment, but this is a beautiful, beautiful floral clasp. And this is also, this is platinum with a diamond surround, and I believe that the center is glass, but it's quite nice. And this is a Cimento, so the Italian maker of Cimento. It's 18 karat gold, and it's the Figaro chain. Here to sell at 6,900. This is a beautiful, beautiful antique ladies watch. So it actually, it was repaired. So typical of these, um, these mesh bracelets, there were some, some snags, but it's been repaired since. Really nice diamond surround. I mean, it doesn't get nicer to this. Can you imagine where the, what this has seen, this bracelet? Um, and this is a Bustamante sterling brooch. And then this is Papier Miche of Noah's Ark. In at two to 300 with the original little dust bag. An Omega wristwatch, 14 karat gold, out of a local Larchmont estate. And then this is a little interesting, 14 karat gold and inlaid pendant. So large inside, we have a dragon on one side with the pearl and the ruby eyes. And then here we have some carved coral, opal, rubies, turquoise. So really interesting. It comes with this little piece of paper. I don't know where the paper came from, but it describes what's included in this piece. Out of our Philadelphia state, we have a, a double strand pearl necklace with the 18 karat gold emerald and diamond closure. 14 karat gold, kind of a lavalier or a bolo form necklace with the little pineapple tassels. Um, interesting piece. 
And this is just an outstanding, outstanding piece out of Irvington. So this is a barrel, so a very large 157 carat barrel with opal drops and diamonds. But I mean, this is phenomenal. Just look at the quality of the stone. There's not an inclusion in sight. Um, this actually, this is, this came from Doyle. So this sold at Doyle, I believe 10 years ago with an estimate of 15 to 20,000. And it's here to sell at five to seven. And it even comes, I mean, this is just quality when you have a fitted case for a, a pendant of this size. I mean, I could only imagine how they made the case just to fit it. But that's here to sell out of Irvington at five to 7,000. Here we have a cameo out of Philadelphia, and this is in the style of the Roman imperial cameo. So this is carved sardonyx, and you can just see, this is flora, so this is the goddess flora, um, how they use the, the different layers to make the background and the face and then the flowers. So it's all these different shades of color with the nice pearl surround. It's beautiful, four to 600. Interesting 18 karat gold brooch. It has an inscription on each of these green stones, enamel surround and diamond accents. More contemporary piece, this is a gilt silver Judith Lieber with the, its costume, but it's really, it's a good looking bracelet. So it's really in right now, nice statement piece. Um, and again, here's another nice contemporary piece. This is by Maurice Katz. So it's 14 karat gold with the carved bone and a single band of diamond accents. I love this ring. I mean, it's really such a great cocktail ring. Really, really nice. This is a Walker chronograph watch. Interesting, 18 karat gold, four to 600. And if we can just take a picture, a peek at this picture, this is at GIA right now. So this is an emerald that went in for its country of origin and identification report. It's deco, it's beautiful, it's set in platinum with tiers of diamond accents. It's really quite nice and it should be back by tomorrow. So please check back on our website for all of that information. Um, and one of my favorite silversmiths, um, this is a William Spratling sterling all form brooch with the ebonized wood eyes. So it is fully marked verso at three to 500. Again, out of our Philadelphia estate, really just so sweet. It's a carved lion. And I do believe that this is amber. It's 14 karat gold mounted. It was something else at one point because you can see that it was drilled as a bead. So I don't know what its previous life was, but it's here as a little brooch or pendant. And he's really well carved and beautiful. Another funky ring in the sale, carved stone mounted in 14 karat gold as kind of, I guess a grape. So there is this beautiful scrolling tendrils and, and leaves and then the little finial here as leaves and this is in at four to 600. So moving on to men's watches. This is a Piaget 18 karat gold wristwatch. It is a polo watch um, with the original box and the original exterior case, really heavy. I mean, I believe, I believe it's somewhere around 93 penny weights. So this is a significant watch and has a great look, the graduated band. Other watches, we have an 18 karat gold Rolex Oyster Perpetual. We have a Hamilton Thinomatic. We have a Belova Accutron. And this, never I've never seen one of these before. This is a Mont Blanc Miserstruck 18 karat gold chronograph watch. And you can see the open escapement or the with the half plate. Really nice though, a really good looking watch. I mean, I wouldn't wear it, but I think some guy out there would surely appreciate it if somebody wanted to buy it for him for the holidays. Um, and then this is a Baum and Mercier. This is a quartz movement, but it's a nice looking watch also in the tank style. And moving away from watches and into some more jewelry, we have this graduated, individually beaded coral necklace with a 14 karat gold closure. Uh, 14 karat gold. This is Victorian with the, the bird carrying the letter. The canateal motif here. It is a locket, so it does open verso. Uh, the bail did, there was a bail at some point, but that's an easy fix. It's beautiful, three to 500. This is an Italian 18 karat gold oversized charm with the pudi, with the quiver of arrows, turquoise cabochons, carved flowers, eight to 1200. 1.22 round brilliant cut diamond. This is EF color and SI3 clarity, but really a good looking ring, flanked by the diamond accents and set in platinum. Three seal stamps or, or fobs, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, we have this one with a little bloodstone, so it has a familial crest. This one is again a familial crest, and then this one is so sweet with a little lamb. So this is gold with a little lamb finial. Southwest Jewelry, this is by Jeanette Dale. 
Um, so she is still a working artist, squash blossom necklace, but beautifully she kind of made her own twist on the squash blossom. So it's not the typical parachute beads and naja pendant. It's got a little bit of a different flair to it. It's beautiful at five to seven hundred. Uh, contemporary diamond jewelry. So we have this nice vintage diamond ring. This is about it's about half a carat, maybe a little less than half a carat with a diamond surround at four to six hundred. We have this Rivier style necklace. So all of these diamond accents and the graduated form terminating in this cluster of diamonds. So really nice at fifteen to twenty five hundred. Again, this is a signed piece, so we we come to the pendant here. So we've got the checkerboard of the diamond form checkerboard of diamond accents, the double surround of diamonds, and this is at four to six hundred. And then this is on a 14 karat gold chain, lots of diamonds. So we have the, the tapered baguettes and then the, the central cluster of diamonds. Antique jewelry grouping. So we have the Scottish silver dirk form brooch with the hard stone inlay, 22 karat open work brooch. We have, this is Victorian with the enamel and it's actually, you can see the woven hair verso. So interesting. And then a carved cameo and this is in gilt silver. So out, actually we have Irving Katz estate from South Salem. So this is the Gemini with the round brilliant cut diamond accents on this choker length necklace. Again, Irving Katz, two pair of earrings together at in 18 karat gold at five to 700. This is a four to $600 Victorian bracelet. Another grouping that I believe is by Irving Katz came from his estate again. So we have these central medallions and then there's diamond accents to the pendant. So these are clip-on earrings and then a nice pendant. This is the Etruscan Revival 15 karat gold with rubies and diamonds, beautiful canateal detailing. Another Southwest jewelry grouping. So we have squash blossom necklace with the matched earrings and then these beautiful figural inlaid pendants to this squash blossom necklace. Um, this is a chagrin silver plate mounted vanity box. I'm not going to be able to open it. With the mirrored interior, really nice. Original receipt for $1,600. Here to sell at four to 600 with the lines with rings in its mouth. Incredibly heavy. 18 karat gold bicolor necklace with diamond accents. So you can see the links have these diamond accents to them. It's wonderful. It's a beautiful statement necklace. Absolutely could be dressed up or dressed down. Um, Edwardian platinum and 18 karat gold diamond necklace. I love that it's tiered. So we have the drops here. If you can just zoom into the old European cut diamonds with the Colette settings. And this is the illusion setting that makes it appear as though they're large diamonds. It's actually one large diamond to each and then little trifoils of three smaller diamonds. It's beautiful. I mean, even if you take a look at the back, that's, that's how you really tell quality is look how, how well it's made. You can just see how it's articulated, how the movement that this, the way that this was made allows it to sit. Really wonderful at four to 6,000. Interesting earrings. Um, so these are pearls with the diamonds, the round brilliant cut diamonds. Um, they're marked 18 karat, also came from our Philadelphia state, and they have the La Poisson uh, Cartier backings. So where they came from, I'm not saying, but they do have Cartier backings and they're beautiful quality. And then I'm going to end with this really wonderful grouping of intaglio and cameo rings, came from Philadelphia. The, the father was a collector. Um, I don't have a definitive answer on age for these, but they're beautiful. Um, this is Heracles with the Nimian lion hide and a bow, but it's a, I mean, these are so beautiful. Mounted in 20 karat gold. This one is a dog and it is actually inscribed with the motto of Queen Elizabeth the first. This, I believe, is garnet, again, set in 20 karat gold. These were all remounted at some point at a later year, not at the original point of creation. Um, and I believe that this is Mars standing with a staff and shield. This, again, is Heracles with the Nemean lion hide and a staff, and there's some sort of statue to his, to his right, again, mounted in 20 karat gold. This is a Niccolo, so this is, that's the, the name of this stone, and it's a reclining nude with a snake. And again, this is mounted in 20 karat gold. And then this is a Gnostic Ptolemaic. So this is a creature, some sort of monster. And there's some sort of fearful human in the back, but it's really kind of amazing. 
um, and it does come with this little paper that says that it's first century BC from Alexandria. And again, it mounted, mounted later in 20 karat gold. Um, cool as anything, here to sell, all from our Philadelphia state. And that wraps it up for my preview of the September 29th auction, and we hope to see you there.